Welcome back to part number two of chapter five in this lecture series on cybersecurity operations with me, Joachim Chevrestad from the University of Skövde. I just want to revisit the marketing we, uh, for our study programs a little bit. So if you uh, like what I'm trying to teach here, uh, and especially if you happen to like my style of teaching, you could go in to uh, www.his.se slash NSA, um, which is the uh, uh, Networks and Systems Administration's bachelor program where I'm teaching uh, data communication and uh, security mainly. Uh, this is a program that is given as a campus program in uh, uh, fully in Swedish, so, so you'll need to be here and you'll need to uh, to, to, to speak Swedish and, uh, and understand Swedish. Uh, I'm also the co-chair of, uh, of the master program that we give that is called Privacy Information and Cybersecurity. Uh, you can see the URL here. Uh, this master is given as a one-year and two-year master program, uh, one or two-year master program. Um, it's qu quite closely tied to our research groups. Uh, we do research in uh, stuff like standards, uh, usable security, uh, cyber resilience, a little bit on cyber warfare and stuff like that, um, and cyber critical infrastructure as well. Um, and this program is actually given both as a campus version and as a full distance version. So uh, you can take this, uh, this program from the comfort of your own, own home. All the lectures and sessions are streamed in real time, so you can attend live uh, and follow the entire program uh, on distance. And the, the admissions for the admission deadlines uh, is uh, January 15th uh, annually for international students and uh, April 15th for Swedish students. So let's go into part number two on this network uh, security infrastructure lecture. Uh, and in this part, we will talk about some security devices and services. So let's skip right through it. <clears throat> and uh, discuss some security devices. So uh, just as we need network infrastructure to uh, to perform or provide a resilient and well-performing network and a network connection, we need a layer of security um, in our networks. So one such layer is provided by the use of networking devices developed to provide security functions. Uh, and two common such devices that will be the main focus of this lecture is firewalls and intrusion detection systems. Uh, so let's uh, let's introduce firewalls. Uh, firewalls are systems that enforce access uh, control policies between networks, uh, which is a very fancy way of saying that firewalls filter traffic. Uh, firewalls must, of course, themselves be resistant to network network attack. As if someone takes down the uh, the security appliance of a network, it would be like someone taking down the police department in in a town. Uh, security will be. <laughs> Uh, less than perfect. Um, and the idea with the firewall is that you make the firewall or the firewalling function act as the only transit point between the internal and the external network. So all traffic going to and from your network should be filtered to uh, through the firewall. And in this way, the firewall can, uh, can enforce the access control policy. And access control in this sense means what traffic that is allowed to <coughs> leave and enter the network network based on predefined rules. So uh, some, of the, uh, some of the benefits with using a firewall is that they prevent the exposure of sensitive hosts, resources, and applications to untrusted users. Uh, it's, usually, it's essentially used to hide uh, whatever devices that shouldn't be uh, open and visible to the outside world. Uh, they sanitize protocol flow uh, which prevents the exploitation of protocol flaws. Uh, so, for instance, uh, there is an attack called uh, TCP SYN flood that uh, exploits the functionality of uh, uh, TCP session establishment that we talked about before. Uh, using a firewall, you can detect when a TCP SYN flood is happening um, and uh, try to prevent it. We'll talk about this more later. I don't know if it's in this lecture or a later lecture. Um, you can block malicious data from servers and uh, from servers and clients, so you can just block stuff that that you know shouldn't be there, um, and uh, you can also use the firewalls to reduce the security management complexity by offloading most of uh, most of the network access control to a few firewalls in in the network, which essentially means that you can centralize the uh, the control of network traffic to network based firewalls. Um, so looking at some of the limitations that firewalls have or introduce, um, or basically what a 
what a firewall is not. So it goes without saying that uh, a misconfigured firewall can have serious uh, consequences for the network, uh, um, mainly because they easily become a single point of failure. So if we have one device that all traffic needs to uh, be filtered through, if that device goes down, well, then no traffic is flowing anywhere. Um, uh, also, the, the data from several applications can, can simply not be passed over, uh, over firewalls securely. Uh, one such thing is that we, we do have, uh, for instance, a network address translation that rewrites IP addresses. They, they make firewalling a little bit more difficult. Um, users may proactively search for ways around the firewall to receive, for instance, blo blocked material. Uh, and this exposes the network to potential attacks. So, for instance, there's been um, examples of uh, users um, introducing 4G uh, modems to uh, into the network, but just because they need to have or they want to uh, view material that is prohibited. So, many companies, for instance, uh, implement firewalls to uh, to ensure that users may not, uh, I don't know, stream video, use Netflix. Uh, but the user wants to use Netflix, so the user uh, introduces a 4G mo modem to have internet connectivity without a firewall and uh, can watch Netflix, but of course that becomes another attack vector. And this, this comes down to what I'm uh, to my research area, which is basically that when we prohibit users too much uh, or when, when, we, when we make make users miserable by implementing security features, uh, they will circumvent the features and uh, then the uh, security will be compromised overall. Uh, of course, here we have a trade-off of, um, of having a fair amount of security, uh, but still allowing the users some freedom. Um, and there are many techniques to do this, and what you really want to do is, uh, is try to develop a sound security culture where the users actually uh, accept having, uh, having some security features uh, within the network. Okay, long explanation of that, but let, let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, network performance can slow down, um, and this comes down to, uh, well, first of all, uh, we do have this uh, one or two or just a few points where uh, traffic is being filtered. All traffic has to go through those, those points, so there's a lot of load on those devices. Uh, also, the firewalling function in itself or the firewalling process is uh, CPU intense, so uh, having a lot to do just, well, makes it tough to work quickly. Um, also, it's possible to uh, tunnel or hide uh, unauthorized traffic um, or um, disguise it as legitimate traffic and just pass it through the firewall using different um, different techniques. Um, and uh, I think we will explore that later in, uh, in a later chapter. Uh, so, we started saying firewalls, and just to make things a little bit more complicated, there are of course uh, a few different types of firewalls, uh, mainly three. Uh, so first we have stateless firewalls or packet filtering firewalls, and those are quite simple. They filter traffic based on layer 4 and some layer, uh, some, uh, based on level, level 3, and some layer 4 uh, information. So basically you, you create filtering rules based on source and destination IP address and source and destination port numbers. So let's say that you, for instance, do not have any web service within your network, then you can block all traffic on port 80 because no one should communicate with your network on port 80. Um, then we have uh, stateful firewalls that can also include some context of communication. Uh, that's, for instance, uh, tracking TCP flows um, and uh, block possible uh, TCP SYN flood attacks. Um, application firewalls that can also filter traffic based on application layer characteristics. So you can, for instance, have uh, a web application firewall uh, that, uh, that filters certain um, HTTP requests. So you may, for instance, say that it's, it's not possible to do put requests to your web server. You can only do uh, get requests or uh, post requests are only allowed from the inside network, stuff like that. Um, there are also different ways in which the firewall can be implemented. So uh, we have uh, we have network-based and host-based that are the most common. Uh, where a host-based is like the Windows firewall, a firewall that is implemented on one local machine, or a network-based firewall that is uh, a network-based appliance. Uh, and we also have transparent that filters traffic between a pair of bridged interfaces. Not going to say more about that. Or a hybrid that combines different firewalling techniques. 
so let's leave firewalls for now. We'll revisit firewalls uh, in a little while and also later in the course. But now I want to talk to you about um, intrusion detection and prevention and IDS systems and IPS systems. Uh, so firewalls uh, analyze traffic metadata, if you will. Um, data about data, addressing port numbers, uh, session data and such. Um, IDPSs, uh, that's the term I use to, for both, both IDS and IPS, they can analyze the actual data. Um, and um, what they do is that they use signatures to define, uh, to discover ha harmful data. So uh, you can say that they are similar to an antivirus program uh, that uses virus definitions, but they are a network layer. So they can actually unpack uh, data packages sent over the network and see if the content is harmful and in, in that case uh, do something to it. Uh, so the IDPS technologies can either detect atomic signature patterns uh, where they analyze one single packet at a time or composite signature package where they can actually analyze uh, the full content of multiple packets. Uh, and this is important because uh, as you may realize uh, when we send data over the over the internet, we segment it use, uh, as it passes through the OSI model. And for instance, one video file will of course be uh, be sent in a multitude of different packages. Uh, I also want to tell you the main difference between IDS and IPS is that ID intrusion detection systems detect, while IPS uh, intrusion prevention systems can also prevent. And the difference here is in how they are uh, implemented in the networks. Uh, the IDS is usually uh, implemented as a bucket on the side, so you just copy all traffic sent through, uh, for instance, a router, and you let the uh, IDS handle it uh, out of bands, uh, wh whereas you put the IPS as a filter just as you would a firewall. Uh, and as you can, as you can surely uh, appreciate, this, uh, this brings some uh, limitations or some differences in how they can act. So for instance, you can allow a lot of false positives, false alarms with an IDS, because you can look at all alarms manually, they won't impact network performance. Uh, whereas the IPS needs to have uh, less false positives because when it has an alert, it will block the traffic. Um, and the other thing is that this is really CPU intense processes uh, and to have an IPS that does not impact network performance, you, you really have to have a monster of a, a, monster of a box that, uh, that does the task. Uh, whereas you can have a little, uh, little worse performance on the IDS because it won't impact network performance. Uh, so let's do a more uh, let's do a comparison. This is something. Uh, this is a picture that is good to uh, to have in mind when you do the certification test. So if we look at uh, IDS, the advantages are of course that you have no impact on the network traffic. Uh, if the sensor fails, you don't have any impact on the network because it's on the side uh, and it can also be overloaded. It will perhaps die, but it's not a big problem for network performance. Uh, however, we cannot take actions because we have the IDS system sitting next to the network. If it, if it finds an alert, alert uh, we can't do any automatic actions uh, that easy. Uh, and this makes it more vulnerable, uh, of course, also to network security evasion techniques. Uh, the IPS, uh, on the other hand, um, the advantage is that it can actually stop uh, harmful traffic and it can use screen normalization techniques. The disadvantages is that uh, issues uh, with, uh, with the sensor as a whole, if it breaks down or if it gets overloaded, uh, it can impact the network performance. Uh, and it can also, yes, because of normal operations, since this is C CPU intense stuff, have impact on, on network performance. So let's take a sip of coffee. Uh, turns out that you get a little bit dry in your throat after uh, one and a half day of straight recording video lectures. Um, so let's move on to IDPS types. Uh, again, those are those can be both host-based and network-based, where host-based uh, IDPSs are installed on a single host, typically an end device, uh, and the, 
an extra um, extra good feature about those is that they can monitor host specific uh, operating systems, processes, um, operating system activity. Um, whereas the network based are implemented as a network device. Um, and a big drawback of those is that it's hard to detect end to end encrypted traffic. So you want to do deep package inspection, but consider uh, sir, browsing the internet using HTTPS, for instance. Then you will have end encryption between your client and the web server. Um, and since the traffic is encrypted, the network based uh, IDPS cannot uh, really detect or, or, or analyze it. Uh, of course, any modern uh, network usually combines those types, so you have both network based and host based sensors. So we're closing in on the roundup of this uh, second part of this uh, chapter 5 and now we're going to go through some different uh, protocols and techniques and we will begin with access control lists or ACLs um, and ACLs is basically a technique that can be used to uh, to implement firewalling on Cisco routers. Uh, ACLs are basically lists with uh, statements or access control entries that determine if traffic should be permitted or denied. Uh, so you can have a list of statements telling you that okay, data from this IP address to this IP address is allowed, data to this IP address using this port is denied, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, the uh, uh, the different things that you can use uh, in your filters or what you can filter traffic based on is uh, source IP addresses. Um, this when you use standard access control lists, you can only filter based on source IP address. Um, you can use what is called extended access control list, and then you can also filter traffic based on destination IP address, source, and destination port number and protocol type. Uh, for instance, ICMP, TCP, and UDP. Um, and there are some optional protocol type information that you can also include in uh, extended access control lists. Um, the next protocol is SNMP or Simple Network Monitoring Protocol. Uh, that is a protocol that can be used to manage and monitor and add intermediary devices in a network. Uh, and a monitoring tool such as this helps you discover and solve problems um, in your network and monitor network performance. Uh, so there are three elements in SNMP. Uh, you have an SNMP manager, uh, which is essentially a server function, and then you have SNMP agents that are installed on hosts. Uh, and on the host, you also have something that is called the Management Information Base, or the MIB, uh, and what this, it does is that it stores data and operational statistics on the host. And then it's uh, uh, the idea is that the server or the manager will request information or actions uh, from the hosts whenever needed. Um, next technology is NetFlow, uh, which is important for the certification test in, uh, of this course. It's a Cisco technology. Um, I would guess that it's proprietary. Uh, it provides statistics on packets flowing through a Cisco router or multi-layer switch. Uh, so traffic, uh, it tracks flows and distinguishes uh, between different data flows using seven different fields. Uh, those are source and destination IP address, source and, source and destination port numbers, uh, layer 3 protocol type, uh, TCP, UDP, or ICMP, uh, type of service marking, which, uh, which is essentially if you have a quality of service marking that, uh, and that classifies traffic, uh, and also the input logical interface, which is uh, the port in which traffic enters the device. Uh, port mirroring is uh, very important, uh, and what it does is that it allows a switch to duplicate traffic sent through it. So uh, for this is something that you need if you want to have a packet analyzer or an intrusion detection system that is out of bands. And uh, how it works is just like this. Let's say we have a switch here, uh, and we want to have a packet analyzer or IDS on the side. So essentially, any traffic going through the switch on these three ports will be copied to the and sent out to the packet an analyzer. Uh, switch log, um, uh, of course, in security as well as troubleshooting, logs are uh, golden, worth their weight in gold, even if the weight is, uh, if we ca count it in data, uh, I guess zero. Mm -hmm. And syslog is a logging service, and what it does is that it allows uh, uh, it allows syslog enabled hosts to send logs to a central logging server, uh, where you can consolidate and al analyze logs in one central point. 
Uh, syslog allows you also to fine-tune what you want to log, um, at what level you want alerts. So for instance, do you want uh, informational messages that may t tell you when, uh, I don't know, a packet arrives or an IP address is changed, or do you just want critical errors uh, telling you that uh, the machine is uh, catching fire? <coughs> Sorry for that. Um, NTP, uh, Network Time Protocol, uh, and this is a protocol that is used to synchronize time uh, with central time server, uh, and the purpose is to ensure that the time is identical and correct within the network. Uh, and having correct time is also very, very important, or being, knowing that you can trust the timestamps in your network is very important when you try to reconstruct events, because uh, you want to know in, in what order things happened, when things happened, stuff like that. Um, NTP servers are arranged in three different levels, uh, depending on how trustworthy they are, uh, and those levels are called strata. Uh, so a stratum zero device uh, is uh, an authoritative time source, and this is a time source, usually an external time source, that are assumed to be accurate. Uh, a stratum one device is an NTP server that gets time from a stratum zero server and act and usually act as a prime primary network time standard. So usually you set up a, an NTP server in your own network and you have it uh, synchronized with a stratum zero device that is external. Uh, and then below the stratum one device you can have stratum two, stratum three, stratum four, and so on and so forth. Uh, and those are devices that synchronize with the stratum one. Two, three, four servers. So a stratum two device synchronizes with stratum one, a stratum three device would synchronize with a stratum two device, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's NTP in a nutshell. Uh, next, uh, I want to finish off this lecture with discussing AAA a little bit. Uh, so AAA is essentially or is an architectural framework for configuring. Uh, three, impo uh, three important and independent security functions. And those are authentication, authorization, and accounting and auditing. Uh, so that's actually four A's when you think of it. Okay, anyhow. So authentication is um, uh, means that you prove that you are who you say you are. Uh, you can say that when I walk into a shop and I want to buy some, um, I want to buy some Belgian beers, um, Bruxessot, for instance, which happens to be my favorite, uh, the clerk will uh, um, ask you, okay, how are you? And I say, well, I'm Joachim and I'm old enough. And then I authenticate myself using a passport, uh, which means that I prove that I am who I say I am. Uh, authorization, on the other hand, is the process of determining what resources the user can access and what actions the user can perform. So first you log in saying who you are, and then you get authorized uh, and handed different permissions. Finally, we have accounting and auditing uh, that records what the users and different resources does. So we can backtrack what happened in our system. Uh, Radius and TACX Plus are two common authentication protocol that uh, are used to communicate with AAA servers. And I'm going to explain those real briefly. Uh, I think this is yet another picture that is very important to have in mind when doing the certification test. Uh, so functional, if we look at TACX Plus first, uh, functionality wise it separates uh, AAA according to the AAA architecture and allows for modularity of the ser security server implementation. Uh, this is a standard that is mostly Cisco supported, it uses TCP as the transport protocol. Um, it uses a bi-directional challenge and response uh, that is similar to, similar to the, or that is used in the challenge handshake authentication protocol, SHAP. Uh, in terms of confidentiality, the entire TACX Plus package is encrypted. Uh, it provides authorization uh, of router commands on a per user or per group basis, and accounting is limited. Uh, so if you look at radius instead, um, RADIUS uh, combines authentication and author authorization, but separates accounting, uh, which makes it less fle flexible than TACX+. Um, on the other hand, it's an open uh, or an RFC standard, so it's more open than TACX+, which is mostly Cisco supported. It's, it uses UDP uh, as the transport protocol. It has a unidirectional challenge and response from the RADIUS uh, security server to the RADIUS client. Uh, only the password is encrypted. Uh, it has no option to authorize router commands on a per use or per group basis. So I would guess that if you want a protocol to use for Cisco routers, then TACX Plus would be the one to use. And in any other case, go with RADIUS. 
uh, accounting is extensive. Uh, so I would guess that the three most important things to take from the slides is that TACX Plus is mostly Cisco supported, whereas Radius is an open standard. Uh, the TACX Plus encrypts the entire packet, where Radius only encrypts the password. Uh, accounting is limited in TACX Plus and extensive in Radius. Okay, we leaving AAA and uh, rounding off with VPN. Uh, so VPN or virtual private network is a protocol that allows you or functionality that allows you to create an encrypted network uh, or tunnel between two endpoints. Uh, and what it does is that it allows you uh, to encrypt communication that is sent over an insecure network such as the internet. So one of the foundations of VPN is that you send confidential traffic from one site to another site using, using a network that you deem as insecure, but you should still receive security. Uh, you can do this in two different ways. You can either have a site-to-site -site VPN. Uh, what it does is that it connects two or more networks together. So you essentially make, uh, if you have different sites in your organization, you combine them together using uh, VPN. So you can have secure communication between your sites. Uh, or remote access that connects a single host to a network and it's usually, uh, for instance, used for remote workers. If you have employees working from home, uh, they can use a VPN tunnel to connect securely to the company network. Um, and this is a picture just to, uh, just to show you what you want to achieve. So you have a company network over here, uh, you have some remote network, you, uh, remote worker, you have some other remote worker, you have some home user or perhaps another site. Uh, in between is just a broadband connection using the internet and using a VPN tunnel you can actually create encrypted connections between all of those into the company network. So that was a lot of stuff. Uh, feel free to leave questions in the comments field and see you next time.